Hey everybody, I'm your host, Robbie Straczynski, and thanks so much for joining us once again on episode number 54 of Cards Chat, the friendliest poker podcast in town. Just like last episode's guest, today's guest is another one of our new ambassadors here at Cards Chat. He's a longtime member of the Cards Chat community with over 7,000 posts in his 13 plus years on the forums. He's evolved from a recreational player with a nine to five job to a vlogger and a content creator to a professional live and online player and poker coach. He's a successful cash game and, cash game and tournament player with over $277,000 in live tournament earnings and plenty more online. Today, we'll get to know Scourge a little better. Matt Vaughn, welcome to the Cards Jam podcast. Wow. Th thank you. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say my screen name aloud in a uh, any kind of like interview or whatever. So that, that felt good. That was fun. Okay. Thank well, you. thanks for referencing what that is for people <laughs> who are unfamiliar. Scourge with like a, yeah. it's a, it's a triple R. One second. It's uh did I read enough R's there? The double R. <laughs> uh, the double. Yeah. It's got the double R. So you gotta, you gotta misspell your common word usernames. Otherwise they're always taken. Exactly. Um, so I gotta ask why. So why did you choose that name? That's question number one. Oh boy, yeah. So I'm. I believe uh, back in like middle school, I used to play this um, multiplayer game called Puzzle Pirates. Okay. Um, so shout out to Puzzle Pirates. That's um, <laughs> it's actually like a pretty cool game, but uh, that was the first like game screen name I think I ever had was was that game because it was multiplayer, and so. I, you know, whatever, I was like 11 or something wow. <laughs> and just started using it. And then I was playing, you know, I started playing poker, uh, like online free rolls underage. Mm -hmm. And so like I needed screen names. So I, uh, it immediately transferred. So, you know, I was probably like 13 or 14 or whatever yep. when I first had like an online poker account. Wow. Uh, so don't tell anybody. I mean, I didn't like have money on my accounts or anything, but you know, sure. I had the accounts. You're, and, a little bit um, You're not the only one who, who did that yeah, sort of thing. Of so. course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not like I was making millions or anything. So it's, right. you know, for, not as much like I need to sweep that under the rug, but it, it's always um, funny how it only matters if someone wins big, right. <laughs> you know, Oh, always, <laughs> always. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I did spin up, I think a couple free rolls to like a hundred dollar bankroll and then dusted it playing like $2 heads up, sit and goes or whatnot. But gotcha. uh yeah, so that screen name really just stuck. Like by the time I was old enough to maybe feel like I didn't want it, I just had had it so long that, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the the guys who have the the emails that are like, you know, big shooter four five seven o two, and you're like, what, <laughs> like what is this number? Oh, uh, you reminded know, me, my name? first yeah. email address was I like my car at aol.com. <laughs> like, a yep. <laughs> God. I Good mean, that actually, that feels feels like you could brand that. I mean, that, right? that feels like there's a business there somewhere. At but. the time, I really, I had a Ford Mustang. It was great. You know, it was, <laughs> it was good stuff. Nice. Anyway, so a poker wise, you said that you're a product of the moneymaker boom. And when it comes to like the vlogging and the content creation, you've noted, uh, you know, Brad Owen and Andrew Nimi uh, as your key influences. So let's start before we get to the vlogging, let's just start specifically with the poker, um, you know, the moneymaker boom. So how exactly did you get started uh, and, and get involved with poker? Was it just sort of watching it on TV? Yeah, so um, but I, I think that like, you know, I, same as a lot of people, I was introduced to poker just through family. Like it's just, mm. it really is, I think kind of America's game in a lot of ways. It's, uh, just so easy to, you know, get around the kitchen table and, and start playing cards. And I think yeah. so that's how a lot of us get it, at least exposed to it in some facet. Um, but the funny thing is like, I don't really associate very strongly with like learning, how to play you know I didn't really play a lot with my dad I think I dabbled with friends for a while but yeah I really uh you know 2003 moneymaker won uh, the world series of poker main event and I was what like 12 so <laughs> you know I I was not like the typical like when people were like how can you be a product of the moneymaker era like right. way too young uh yeah i mean like i i somehow was exposed to it. must have just been on espn and watched a little bit and really started to kind of fall in love with the the coverage and the story the narratives right. and um you know i wasn't really like i never really got into 
gambling per se. So it wasn't like, oh my God, the money or, oh my God, the swings. It just kind of interested me as a game. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I was like 12, 13, I'm like starting to dabble, starting to play online a little. And of course, like the only thing I knew how to do was just play tight. And, um, you know, like that's how I won a couple of free rolls and whatever, but I didn't really have any deeper understanding of strategy. It was just kind of like, this is cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But one, one of the other folks who, let's just say was a pretty common sight on those early broadcasts of the World Series of Poker, Phil Helmuth. You know, he was our guest here, episode number four of the podcast. Um, and, you know, that's a, a familiar name to you. You're, you know, you were in college in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, you know, that's Phil Helmuth country. Uh, was, it, was any part <laughs> of you sort of drawn to him and his sort of unique personality? I'm like, oh, okay, that, that's also kind of cool. Let, let's get a little bit more into poker or... Am I, am I projecting? <laughs> uh, definitely projecting a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, I, so I, I actually went to school in Cleveland and my Madison connections were actually uh, my first job after college. I was living in Madison and it's funny oh, because I didn't okay. even, I, you know, by that point I was very into poker. Like I was taking it very seriously and I didn't mm. even know uh, at the time when I was moving there that he was like you know grew up there and and was a staple in that community so it's kind of funny that you, that you uh that you draw to that you know I, I did actually i did get some more exposure to phil helmy through like watching high stakes poker watching poker after dark like the old school where like you know ev like everybody on the show was a character and it yeah. was, i think like those narratives were really compelling and it's a big mm -hmm. part of what drew me kind of further into the game and and also honestly exposed me at least somewhat to you know, poker as a, as a somewhat deeper strategic, you know, endeavor, I guess. Um, but it took me a while to sort of uh, find that path and actually start to like walk down it basically. Got it. Okay. Well, once you did and, you know, poker became much more part of, Hey, this is what I do. You know, <laughs> this is what I'm, I'm into this sort of thing. Um, I understand you used to play a lot in the Washington DC in the Beltway area. Um, that's, not usually the first place people point to when they say, oh, poker hotbed. But the fact of the matter is, you know, last few years, you got Maryland Live, you got what, Horseshoe, you got the uh, MGM National Harbor. I mean, there's a good few rooms there. Like, is, that, is that where you played? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think that people who aren't pretty in the live streets and pretty sort of um, I guess talking with like a lot of pros who play at the two, five and five, 10 levels might not think about this, but uh, a lot of times when new poker rooms and new casinos spring up, those are like some of the best games usually, mm. because a lot of times you find that the, uh, these, I mean, poker's everywhere. Right. And so sure. there's these communities of home games and there's just like small pockets of private games. And then when casinos are kind of brought in and poker rooms are there, a lot of times these guys are not super serious, but they enjoy playing the game. And so uh, you'll, you'll find pros that just like flock to, to new areas, new mm -hmm. casinos opening up. And so um, I, I was getting ready to move in like late 2016, early 2017 to Maryland. Um, and at the, well, at the time we were deciding basically where to move. And um, my girlfriend at the time, now fiance, Mickey was basically looking at teaching jobs, like maybe getting into like a teaching program. And there were a couple options around the country and uh, Baltimore was one of them. Uh, there's a program, urban teachers that, that basically places new teachers into city schools. And I was like, well, you know, if I can't have Vegas, I was looking at a couple different spots and actually Maryland was very close to the top of the list. Florida was another, um, another kind of hotbed. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say, the first several years that these places have casinos are always very, very good. And um, yeah, no complaints. I <laughs> had Maryland Live as my main, my main sort of home casino nice. because I was pretty close between that and Horseshoe. They're both like 20, 25 minutes. And I just vastly preferred sitting in Maryland Live. It was just like, right. I find it important, like when I'm going to go to a place and sit there for five to 10 hours sometimes more than 10 hours sure. that I just enjoyed being in the space. It's like, a, um, it's like 50 something tables there. It's a big room, right? Yeah. I think it's 52 actually. Jeez. I don't know how I've never thought about this before, but that's the number of cards in a deck. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I don't know if that's deliberate or random, Good but somehow device. that never, 
Yeah, somehow that never occurred to me. Huh. Um, of course, the other property was MGM National Harbor, which very nice property. I enjoyed being there a lot, but it was like an hour to an hour and 30 minutes, to sometimes two hours, depending on traffic. So right. I think I only I think I only played cash there like literally three times. So there's like two vlogs I have, and those are two of the three sessions I've ever played. <laughs> right. And, and, and in Maryland Live, I, if I recall correctly, I've been there once and there's like a bunch of other stuff to do around there. There's like a huge mall and a movie theater, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maryland Live was very cool as a concept, I think. And, and actually, it's funny. Both, both of the two casinos I think I've spent the most hours in lifetime are exactly like this. So I, I, oh. went, to, I went to college in Cleveland and literally six months before I turned 21, they opened the Horseshoe Cleveland, which is now the uh, Jack, Cleveland right? Jack. Yeah. yeah. Which made me very sad. I was oh. like, <laughs> oh, my heart. That was my first home property. But um, that one is in this cool little spot called Tower City, which is in the very heart of downtown Cleveland. And it's basically a mall now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, the actual casino is in a sort of, like old department store, like a really famous. Right, it's like on the store. third floor or something. Yeah, or something. it's it's a three floor casino, right. which is super rare. Most casinos are, are single floor, right? Um, so you can, I mean, you know where everything is, and right. like, you <laughs> can just walk and you get lost in there. I mean, that's part of it too. But um, Maryland Live is a little different because it is a separate building, but it's connected to one of the one of the bigger malls in the area, right? Uh, Arundel Mills, I think, is the name of uh -huh. it, and mm -hmm. super. It's just super nice area and it a lot of times like casinos aren't always in the nicest areas so it's just kind of cool to have that little like upscale experience of walking around the mall if you need to blow off some steam after a, after right. a bad session <laughs> for sure well you said uh you know if i can't have vegas like uh, at least i'll have you know maryland live now you have vegas at some point yeah. you decided to, it's time time to make that move so you know look you 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 honed your game. You, you followed the money. You, you know, you took what you could from the, uh, you know, the Washington DC Beltway area. Then you make it to Vegas. Do you have to all of a sudden start making any sort of adjustments to your game? Are the games, I mean, it's still two, five is two, five, five, ten is five, ten, but is there some sort of like a different vibe going on in the Vegas rooms versus Becky's? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, this has been talked about a lot and I don't necessarily have a, a ton of insight into it in part mm. because my volume as a player is very split, like compared to certain live pros, I have played quite a big mix of online um, since uh, basically from the start of lockdowns and even from lockdowns being lifted, I, I've transitioned back to being um, quite a mix of mm -hmm. live and online and I play a lot of tournaments. And so um, my, actually my cash game value very, very recently has like skyrocketed. Like I've just been playing nonstop the last two weeks, but I don't, I probably have fewer than 200 hours of live cash game poker since moving, which for, I mean, that's like pretty low for a year. Right. Um, it's been an interesting year though, to be fair. So. It's been an interesting <laughs> year. I didn't come back to live poker until maybe like four or five months ago, something sure. like that. maybe six. So yeah, it's, it's a little unfair to say 200 hours in a year, but um, it's mostly because I, I've just been playing a mix of volume. But yeah, I mean, as far as the differences between locales, I think I think people tend to overstate it. Um, first of all, everybody thinks that their home casino, their home state is the toughest poker. Hate to oh, break sure. it to you. You don't, have the tough, you don't have the toughest games in the country. Right, and, and my <laughs> home game is of. way tougher than that too, of course. Right, of course, <laughs> yeah, of course. That goes without saying. Um, yeah. So, you know, but, the, but there are differences, you know. I, I think that what you find is more of the kind of like over time changes, much more so than like an established market versus an unestablished market is going to oh. have bigger differences than, oh, well, I'm in a different place. And so you'll find that, like two five is reasonably consistent, I think, across the country. But the caveats here and, and part of why Vegas can fluctuate a lot, even just like during the year, is that it's really dependent on what's the biggest game running. Because anytime you have the biggest game running, you're going to attract the best players in the room for the most part. I mean, sometimes the best players don't play the biggest games, but it's going to be rare because the best players tend to win. And they tend to grow their bankrolls and they tend to be interested in winning more and they want to play bigger. And so naturally, if the biggest game in your room is 2-5, which is not uncommon throughout the U.S., uh, you're going to just find that 
you will encounter some pretty good players who are right. playing for a living most mm -hmm. likely because that in most parts of the country is a stake level where you can generate an okay living uh, to a pretty good living, depending on mm -hmm. where you are. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that like, if you're looking at consistency, Vegas to Maryland or Vegas to Florida or whatever, like people will always say, Oh, Florida is so much better. You know, this spot, Texas, I mean, Texas is its own thing, but right. um, you know, this spot's so much better. And it's like, that's true at certain levels, but at one, two, one, three, I think it's pretty consistent in most places. And, you know, the things I'm more looking out for, are like, what's the average stack people buy in for? Like mm -hmm. what, how deep can I sit with people? And, um, those kinds of considerations, I think impact win rate a lot more than, um, oh, this, this field is much tougher or like much softer. Um, the, the other, the kind of like other considerations that don't seem as important, I think are equally, if not more important, most of the time at low stakes. But of course, as you move up, you know, Vegas has 510, uh, which is sometimes the biggest game, not always the biggest game. And Vegas has, because it's so reliant on tourism, has an ebb and flow to it as well. Like there are times of the year where it's like Vegas is incredible. Right. And there's times of the year where like Vegas just cash games aren't that great. Mm -hmm. Sure, I hear that. Well, you said Texas is its own thing. Would you care to uh, <laughs> go into a little bit more depth? Uh, the hottest uh, supernova in in poker, you know, in poker right now, basically. Yeah, well, it, it's kind. Of, I mean, it really harkens back exactly to what I was saying that the level of how good a poker scene is is often dependent on how established it is, and right. so you have like Texas is fairly new in the sense of. Uh, established card rooms that have been around a while and availability of many card rooms as well. That matters too. Right. And obviously it's not like poker is new to Texas, right? Yeah. Like people have been Texas around, but they them, will right. In, right. They've been in home games <laughs> and sure. private games and stuff like that. And so it's just, it's very different. Um, obviously when you, I, I mean, this is very cool that uh, a couple of, you know, Texas air, like, you know, there's several different sort of hubs in Texas that have mm -hmm. good poker, but uh, that those hubs have, you know, a couple of them have sort of embraced content and, you yeah. know, inviting vloggers, having live streams, like that's fantastic. But it also just displays to the world, you know, like what poker is like there. But the reality is like, if you threw a live stream up at Maryland Live, like you would find games like that too. So it's, I do think it's a little bit oversold. Okay. But Texas is this new market. There's, you know, there's money, there's people who are just splashing around. And yeah, I mean, it is very good games. Like I, I can't undersell it too hard. Like right. I, I'm kind of like, <laughs> stay away from Texas. Like I'm going to be back there soon. I want the good games. No, but I mean, of course, like obviously there's still going to be fluctuations place to place. And, and right now, like you said, Texas is kind of the, the new the new yep. kid on the block it's yep. really exciting and good and you know whatever <laughs> absolutely it's certainly certainly interesting to to hear you know from, from folks who have played there and what it's like and you know <laughs> everyone just smiles when they say it so clearly some, <laughs> something good must be happening uh and you talk well, about like the the content creation i want to get into it in a second but yeah. an interesting thing that you pointed out as far as like where the the great players will gravitate to the highest stakes in the room interestingly just i have to point it out it's like the converse actually happened once is that the you know the poorest players not money wise but like skill wise will gravitate to the lowest stakes in the room and that's a very it happened to me in barcelona once just casino barcelona and the lowest stakes in the room was five five euros because like the mm -hmm. ept was going on there mm -hmm. and like well everyone's got money and I was like, man, that's that's just a lot. Five, five. I mean, I, I thought that's a tough game. And someone's like, Robbie, that's the lowest stakes that they're offering. The worst players are playing that game. Get in there. Right. And <laughs> it's the truth. I wouldn't say I'd made right. millions or anything, but yeah. you know, the converse does prove true as well of, of your point. Yeah. And it's it's, I mean, there's there's a lot of like sort of proofs to it i mean mm -hmm. if you look at online like environments that have one cent two cent two cent five cent yep there's a reason why like you know 10 cent 25 cent is sometimes a sort of tough game like relatively yeah. speaking online and that's because like you know the very weakest players are the players who have the least money and uh just want to like splash around they go down there so they don't lose as much like there's right. there's a big element of that and now granted live it's a little different because you do price people out like 
you know, like right. one, like two hundred dollars is not a negligible sum of money to most people. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, if you remove one two, like you just lose some players. Yeah. But the the weakest players who can afford to lose five hundred dollars will obviously be in the smallest game. So right. I will say I bought in for two hundred fifty euros. I cashed out with five fifty, and I was a very happy guy that night. So nice. Nice. <laughs> that was that one time. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about that content creation. Uh, you know, we we know uh, how you got into poker. How how you decide? You know what? Let's start creating some content. Uh, you know, this this is for me. What made you make that decision? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting that. Uh, I've done a few podcasts and interviews like this before. And uh, it's the kind of thing where sometimes you don't like dig into it that much until like you're having a conversation with like somebody you don't know and they ask a question in a certain way you haven't thought about it. And uh, so I, over, the, over the course of doing a number of these over the last few years, I've like kind of dug into it more and realized mm -hmm. that like I've always been kind of a creator in some capacity. And mm -hmm. I just didn't always think of myself that way, or I, I didn't label it necessarily. So, you know, growing up, I was, I really liked writing. Uh, actually, for a short period of time, I wanted to be a writer. Nice. Um, I, I got a very small percentage of the way through a novel once. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just dust my shoulder off on that one. Um, I, I did music all through high school and college, and um you know, uh, as I started getting into poker and taking it really seriously in college, I wrote a blog. And actually, most people don't know this because I've never like aggressively tried to bring people back to it. I like I think there's some really good stuff in there, but a lot of it's also garbage. So, uh, you know, it, it's not something where I'm like, I want to, uh, you know, shine a light on it super hard. But um, actually, I don't even know if I remember the name of it now. It's something about... <laughs> It's something about like something Busto or I don't know. It was okay. some, I thought, it, I thought it was really clever naming it, but anyway, um, I, I had this, yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so I had the, I had this blog and at some point also on cards chat, like I had a progress thread where I just, I mean, it was, it's really old. It's probably like eight years old or, or more maybe wow. at this point. And so I was um, sort of always interested in sharing. And I think that sharing the journey is a is kind of the fundamental aspect of mm -hmm. content creation in poker like it, right. it it can be it can be strategy it can be more personality but there's always the narrative of you and your sort of path through poker and mm -hmm. i think that that's really compelling for a lot of us a lot of it's highly universal but still highly individual at the same time and i think that's really cool and as far as the decision to kind of leap into the vlog, um, as, as you kind of mentioned, I had seen Andrew Nimi, Brad Owen very early. Like I, you know, I was in the YouTube content streets. I was actually, the reason why I saw them so quickly, like I was a very early sub for both of them. The reason I saw them was because I was consuming Trooper content, Trooper oh, okay. 97. Sure. And, and for anybody who doesn't know who he is, uh, he's kind of the OG poker vlogger. Like he's yeah. been around he was around for like probably four years before Andrew Nimi was around yeah. in the YouTube the trooper. Tim yeah, Watts. Yeah, Dutch trooper. <laughs> what up? It's the trooper. Yeah. And um, I, I think that for a lot of people who watch trooper, the reason they get into it and, and a big part of why I got into it is he just displays the Vegas lifestyle. Yes. He shows Vegas scenery. Captures street level. Well. Yeah. Just stand, yeah. Street, yeah. Well, it's interesting because I think he does a good job with both street level, but he's also up there finding like great city shots and mm -hmm. great like landscape shots and yep. all this stuff. And, you know, I was working my nine to five. I loved poker. I, I already had been to Vegas a number of times, loved going to Vegas. And it was just kind of a way to like escape into that world a little bit, you know? And so uh, nothing he did was really like something that I associated with myself maybe doing someday. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something where I was like, oh, wow, I could do that. It was more of that like escapism. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, YouTube algorithm, shout out to the YouTube algorithm, uh, got started getting recommended Andrew Nimi videos very early. And I watched the first couple of his and I was like, wow, yeah, this is great i'm gonna try to not swear on the friendliest poker podcast but you know i this is expletive great was uh -huh. like my reaction to mm -hmm. his first couple of videos and he 
the way he sort of presented it felt even though I loved watching trooper videos for, for that kind of like scenery and whatever, I felt a deeper connection with what Andrew was doing. And mm. I felt like it connected more with what I liked in poker, which is more, you know, at this point I was taking the game very seriously. I wasn't a professional, but I, you know, prided myself on being a winning player. I was trying to move up in stakes, all this stuff. And I was basically at this point in my life where I was looking at getting out of my job and pursuing mm -hmm. poker more, you know, full, full time in some capacity. And so seeing that documented made me kind of lit that fire of sharing again. And I was kind of like, Hmm, like I'm kind of soft planning to leave this job. Mm -hmm. And then that plan started to kind of come together. Um, during that same time period where it was only like the first couple of months or whatever that they were posting. And I was like, well, we made this decision to move. I'm, I'm jumping into poker sort of head first now. And wouldn't it be cool to just kind of like document that honestly, like almost more for myself than for anybody else. But I think it might be kind of fun to work on this and other people might get a kick out of it too. So kind of like, you know, I've, I've always been somebody who wanted to share that part of my journey and, it's always been part for myself and, and part for other people, because I think that the, the documenting is, is really nice as far as like keeping myself sort of, I guess, honest and, and maybe sure. humble when I need it. And, um, and also just something to look back on, which I, I really didn't appreciate right away. But now that I'm like over four years into this, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a very cool aspect. And, and even like back in the day, I would like read old blog posts and be like, wow, like this one kind of didn't suck. This is cool. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the video format is just so remarkably good at this because yeah. it, it is no matter what, it, it's so good at capturing what it was like back then, because when you verbalize, when you emote, when you show, I mean, even like a, like show myself aging, I like, I see videos and, or like gaining and losing weight. Like it sounds so silly, but I'm like, wow, I like, man, I looked really fit in that video. Like, this is, this is great. Or like, wow, I was like, you know, I, I, it's a good thing that I like figured out. I, I was doing, actually, it's funny. I, I, I was pretty over, like, I got a little bit overweight coming into college and going out of college. I think this happens to a lot of us. Um, and I, I didn't really like, know. like, it sounds so dumb, but like, I, you know, it's it happens slow sometimes. And so I feel like watching videos of myself across time was like, oh, okay. Yeah. I was, I was a little further gone than I realized. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think we need to get there. back on that, you know, that cardio grind <laughs> yep. and, the, and the weightlifting grind. But, you know, as far as like the, the impetus to actually go and start, it was kind of, it was kind of all of these things. Like mm -hmm. the catalyst was definitely the move because I was like, you know, my life is kind of boring, but like, I'm about to make this big change. I think that documenting it could be cool. And, mm -hmm. you know, who knows, maybe a few people will watch it. Nice. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the phrase a dime a dozen, but there are, you know, over the last few <laughs> years, lots of vloggers now. What makes Matt Vaughn's vlog unique for those, you know, you know, who, who don't have, you know, 24 seven to watch all because they're all yeah. great. There's so much yeah. interesting perspective. So what, what makes yours unique? Yeah, so I, I do want to give a little context to that, like dime a dozen, because for people who don't watch vlogs, um, and especially who maybe weren't watching vlogs early, like four years ago or more, right. uh, like I said, it, it really was like Andrew jumping into that space, Brad coming very soon after. And then like, I don't know for sure what number I was, but like I was between third and fifth for sure. Oh, wow. Okay. Like as far as hitting that publish button, and a lot of people won't know that, especially because I, I found out I wasn't allowed to monetize my channel on the email address I signed up with. So I have, oh, I wow. like a month and a half or two months in or whatever, I moved everything. So I actually was my first, vi my first video and it's still up on my original YouTube channel, but nobody like it, nobody knows about it. Cause it's so <laughs> tiny, uh, was November, 2016. Wow. And so that and so, is right. really early for sure. Yeah. Right. As we're coming up on five years from like my first post, which is just nuts to me. Um, mm -hmm. So you're talking about a space with like three to five people in it. And then like, you know, it grows to kind of like 10 and I'm like, man, like I'm still in like the top few, you know, like in subscribers and whatever. And as the space, you know, started to grow slowly, but 
you pick up more views, it just explodes because people see what's possible and it, sure. it's kind of exciting. And so uh, a, a friend of mine, 08 Grinder, who's also a content creator. Sure. Mike, he, good guy. Yeah, Mike has, Mike has been sort of tracking for a while how many poker vlogs there were. And he would like, when a new one would come out, like he would just check it out, maybe throw him a couple of views, whatever. And um, he said at some point he just had to stop because it exploded from like, okay, you know, there's like 30 and now there's like 70, you know, like right. go from dozens to now like hundreds. It's like when the, I'm not sure and, my age, when the internet first became a thing, they used to right. track how many pages are there published right. this year. Like you just Right. And it's, it's like, well, at a certain point, you just can't even conceptualize it. Anymore. Right. Like the number's meaningless. Like the difference between a hundred and 300 bloggers is like, I can't keep track of them. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the funniest part of that iteration for me has been going from like, oh man, like I'm the top, you know, five. And I'm like, all right, I'm top 10. And like, now people are surpassing me who have started after me mm -hmm. consistently. Right. Now it's to the point where like, Half the time when I hear about a quote new vlogger who I'd never heard of before, they have more subscribers than me. Right. And I'm just like, oh my whoa, well, the, the game's passed me by now. It's it's all over. But hmm. um as far as like I, I, I'm gonna frame this not as necessarily so much like how, why should you watch me as much as like who should you decide to watch in general? Because Ooh. I think that every every vlogger and every content creator has some sort of like core piece or part of them that is the big draw and maybe they do a lot of things well like the, obviously the people at the top like brad owen somebody who does basically everything well but there's still generally a couple things that bring people to his channel i would say probably like his humor the pacing uh and just he's a very genuine likable guy like those are those are three things that make him very easy to watch right his cat and his, oh, his cat. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, that was a, especially a big one back in the day when the cat was rapping. But um, anyway, uh, you know, for Andrew Nimi, it might be like more cinematography and, you know, like Vegas views and stuff like that. And so I think that, you know, if you are a content creator, it is important to sort of work to identify what you are naturally good at and kind of uh, feed into that more. It's important to work on your your weaknesses too. But I think that almost like cultivating your strengths is especially important on, on the YouTube platform because you're going to develop a core audience who is there for you. So if you work too hard on the stuff that's not really like you, it's not even that valuable because they're they're there for the thing that you're good at and that you like doing. Um, so finding those intersections, I think is always important in, in any pursuit, really mm -hmm. any job, but especially on YouTube, it's important to, to do all that stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself because it's almost getting into like burnout and making sure you don't <laughs> burn out, but bringing it back to the actual question yeah. of kind of like, you know, what's, what's my draw. I think in the early days, I was the only one who was going in depth hand analysis. Mm -hmm. And so that was like the number one thing that people kind of liked about it i also get perceived i i don't want to say like i'm the i'm not the best player on youtube for sure and i'm not the best vlogger player whatever but people perceive me as somebody who's very good at the game and i think the reason why i receive that perception so frequently is because the way i just come across the way i disseminate hands the way i talk about my thought process is very accessible and I wasn't necessarily like a coach when I started the vlog per se, but I've always been somebody who had some element of teaching, some element of uh, community and sharing hands and, and practicing that communication. And so I think that that's a skill that does come naturally to me, but that I've also cultivated through other areas. And that's probably the number one thing. I also think I'm not the worst guy on the planet. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I, th I think people like seeing me succeed in general. Sure. Um, and I think that capturing some of the emotions of the game, it's something I've actually moved away from a little bit on the channel, but it's something I did a lot more in the early stages of the vlog. There's actually one video. Um, it's, it's one of my most watched videos. Uh, it's called the darker side of poker. Mm. And it's a session where like, I, it, first of all, it's a session where it goes very poorly, partially of my own making, you know, it's, it's just one of those, one of those days. And but I, I captured it very well, I think, uh, both from the like narrative side, content creation side, storytelling arc, but also in the moment, just being very 
brutally honest with the camera and yeah. um, letting the emotions come out where mm -hmm. I, I think that a lot of people connected with that because we've all had those days in poker, like everybody experiences it. And so I think that they were very used to seeing, you know, some combination of like strategy material, which is like very kind of like dry and polished. And then there's like, you know, the high stakes poker where it feels kind of like fake, even when it's, even though it's not fake, like right. it's, it's sums of money that you can't connect with. Right. And it's right. just, it's outrageous. It's over the top. Meanwhile, like I was just some guy in my car, you know, basically, you know, super pissed at himself for how that mm -hmm. session went, you know, and like everybody can relate to that. Moment yeah. Who's played enough poker. Gosh. Well, <laughs> I got to talk about that sign behind you uproar. I mean, I, Andrew Nimi has got his favorable. You've got, you've got the uproar. How did that sort of become your thing? Yeah. It's, it's so funny to me because uh, it's like, my thing that I almost wish wasn't my thing now because <laughs> it's 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 like it's almost connected to the wrong thing. So oh, gosh. I went through a couple a couple uh, iterations of starting to stream on Twitch, mm -hmm. uh, not just doing YouTube, streaming uh, mostly tournaments on Twitch, and that's I, I think that Twitch is a great platform for streaming because it has all these elements that drive community sure. and community engagement where I think YouTube is not as good at that. I think they're getting better at it, but uh, they weren't, they certainly weren't as good at, at it as Twitch, you know, a few years ago. And so I gravitated to that platform for streaming and I grew a modest audience, uh, modest viewership. And that was a very tight knit group. And like when you're streaming, you kind of have to fill all the silence. There's, you really never want dead air. It's like a yeah. kind of a radio thing. And that is something that leads you to just kind of like doing a lot of stream of consciousness. You're trying to interact with chat a lot. And these skill sets didn't come naturally to me, but I was working on them. And so, you know, you just like, you're firing stuff off. You're seeing what sticks and, you know, like, I don't know if I played a hand weird or like I lost some hand and, and chat was just like, you know, they're getting outraged, right? They're getting in an uproar. Yeah. And I, I just like a couple times in like one stream, I was just like, all right, guys, like you don't got to get in an uproar about it. Right. Right. And, you know, for, for that community, that kind of stuck. Uh -huh. Now, the problem is there wasn't <laughs> as much overlap between my YouTube community and my Twitch community as uh -huh. I anticipated when I first started. And so I was like getting excited about uproar. I'm like, this is going to be my thing. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, like I even I got tea, I actually think I'm wearing it. I'm wearing an upper t-shirt right now. There you go. Um, <laughs> nice. And that's the original one. We have a better design now. But anyway, uh, the the YouTube community felt like it was being forced on them. Like I started using this tagline, like, don't get in an uproar about it. They're like, what are you saying? We don't understand. Like, why are you saying that? And so, you know, it, it now is just kind of a joke about the joke. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, which, you know, it is what it is. I leave it up there because I like it. Um, not because I, I think that it's necessarily ever going to stick super hard with the, with the YouTube community, but uh, yeah, it's, I think I've sold like three shirts ever. Um, <laughs> well, don't get in an uproar about that's it. Fun. Though, yeah. So. I, I won't get in an uproar about it. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause like, I think that uh, especially early in my YouTube career, I, there were a lot of things I tried to force or sort of finagle mm -hmm. where it's like, all right, you know, Andrew's, favorable is like it's just a word he said a lot and for whatever reason the community latched onto it but it was very organic right yep. and i was trying to to like create something that was like that but wasn't like i couldn't make it organically and so right. um you know the, i i think that content creators struggle with this all the time and most people won't really connect with me saying that but uh it, it's the kind of thing where like you kind of live and learn it and so sure. You know, if, if I could go back, like I probably wouldn't have tried to force it so hard, or I wouldn't have tried to like make this a thing as much. But you know, it's still my thing. Okay. And at this point, at this point, it's organic. So right, and we'll keep uh, the sign up. Right, that's what. Yeah, matters. we'll we'll keep we'll keep the sign up. And you know, it's funny. Like uh, wh when I got this, obviously it's custom. It's not. Sure. It's not like it's my logo. It's not like <laughs> a, a thing you can just buy. And so for me, um, when I uh, I had a couple big like tournament wins one of the things like, I don't really splurge. Like when I win a big tournament, I don't really like spend on myself. It's just, mm -hmm. it goes into the bankroll and savings and, and whatever. 
um, also tournament poker. So like, you're going to lose a lot of it back anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but one of the nice things I did for myself was I, I got a couple custom things made and that was one of them. And so nice. for me, it's also like, it's almost like a trophy because I didn't get a trophy for, <laughs> for these things. <laughs> um, and it just kind of, it's just a nice thing to be like, walk into my office and and this is the, the thing that I look at. So, you know, cool. it, it's a little bit silly, but um, I think that anything that provides you that little bit of extra fire and motivation is is not bad. Nice. And I want to talk about actually one of those, uh, those big scores. Just a couple months ago, you had your biggest ever live tournament score in the $1,100 Venetian monster stack. You emerged yeah. victorious over 329 other people. You got 58K. What does that feel like? Yeah, so it's it's funny because I I played a lot of tournaments this summer, like a lot. And the first part of the summer, I just had all of myself. I was, you know, I had I was basically heatering in cash games leading up to it, and I was very stable financially. And I'm like, you know, it's just like I'm not going to sell twenty percent. 25%. It's just not right. like worth the energy. I'm playing so many tournaments. Let me just take all of myself for, for these like 1Ks, 1.5Ks, whatever. And so, you know, it's like a small shot effectively. Like if you want to think about it, like shot sure. taking, it's kind of like a small shot take. And so I like brick city for a, for a while. Like I was probably, you know, like whatever, like 15, 20, you know, it's not a sob story, but probably like 15 or 20K in entries. Then I hit that score. And obvi so obviously like when you're basically cashless and then you like win something, it's so gratifying. Yeah. I mean, I was doing a ton of work on my game. I played a ton of online MTT volume in the previous 18 months. I was getting MTT coaching. Um, and so, yeah, the, the whole experience is, it's so surreal while it's happening, but it, it's hard to capture that now, but it's still, you know, it, it was a great feeling. And it was funny because like, I think that the, my biggest hand that sort of propelled me from like, okay, we're getting final couple tables. All right, we're final table. And I actually came into the final table as chip leader, but not a big chip leader. And then I eliminated two players in one hand. That hand was probably a mistake. Mm. And so what's so funny about these mm. moments is like, I all it's impossible not to think what if, like what if I just, folded there like I'm probably supposed like this big ICM spot like I what if I right. just fold there like I'm probably supposed to um you know I probably don't win um yeah. and and so the you know the, I I think that the overwhelming feeling as somebody who's been in and around poker for so long I understand how rare these things can be and how much has to go right mm -hmm. so it's just a lot of gratitude as well and I think that taking moments to purposefully practice gratitude is super powerful because it actually almost makes the mean the moment more meaningful because you're kind of like it, you don't take it for granted you're right. you're saying like this didn't have to happen like this this was very fortunate to happen in the way that it did and you know everything that led up to it i think a lot of poker players end up sort of jaded and it's like oh well you know i was 20k in the hole so like i was super due and like you know i i've i deserve this and whatever and, and actually it's that's the phrasing that a lot of people send to me because you know i'm publishing on social media like as this is going on and and i win and like it's probably like the number one message i got was like congrats dude so well deserved awesome and what i just great feeling. you know it feels yeah, it feels good to get those messages, but I also always feel like a little bit of conflict with it because I'm mm. like, you know, it's like maybe on the global scale, I do deserve to have this happen sometimes, but like an individual score like this, I don't ever feel like I deserved it. I just feel super lucky. <laughs> um, and, and, and that tournament in particular, I did get lucky in a, in a lot of hands. You know, I obviously won several all-ins particularly that last big one where I went from like small chip leader to having like 30% of the chips in play with like mm -hmm. seven players left or whatever. Um, but you know, it's important to also be able to look back and, and identify the things you did well. And so I, I tried right. to consciously do that to kind of ground myself but on both levels. Cause I, you know, I, I am a luck box, but I'm not just a luck box. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I feel like I've got, I, I, that just feel, I know I've got a ton of questions for you, but I want to make sure we also have time for the community questions. Uh, but I can't skip a, a few things. I got to, got to ask okay. you, 
One of the right. cool things you did a little while back, you you played a warm up session, uh, two tables of two four heads up against Dunk Polk, while he was preparing for his big challenge against Daniel Negreanu. So, yes. a couple questions, two parters. Uh, what was it like to play against him, and how responsible are you for Daniel losing one point two million dollars? <laughs> Wow, that's an excellent question. Thank you. <laughs> um, man, I would never have thought to frame it that way. So good job. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, first and foremost, I, again, super grateful to just have this opportunity. I think, you know, like, obviously I was, I, I had the channel, I had a reasonably su successful YouTube channel, but at, at the same time, like Doug Polk's tier in poker is well above mine. And I think that what he did to prep was actually, it, it made sense for him selfishly for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think that more than that, it was actually a very cool, almost like service to the community. Oh, interesting way of putting he, it. Okay. He, well, he basically opened the doors and said, I will play anybody once like low stakes. Like this is a guy who hasn't played smaller than five, 10 heads up in years. Probably. Right. Granted he was out of practice. Like he hadn't been playing a lot. Uh, he was sort of soft or tired, right? But at the same time, like, there's not a lot of people who can say in any discipline, I competed against a guy who was once considered the best in this format in the world. Yeah. And you can throw shade at Doug Polk all you want, but there was a period of time where he was considered to be the best, if not one of, or, or one of the best, if not the best heads up. Absolutely. Element player not a doubt about it, for sure. And so... I think that that status doesn't just go away because you're retired. It's like, you know, if like, like a chess grandmaster, you know, like you're still yeah, like skilled. Who, right? Yeah. Or who wouldn't want to play basketball against Michael Jordan yeah. and also like have a shot. Like that's one of the coolest things about poker in general. But I think that Doug Polk specifically opening the door so wide was, was a cool opportunity for the community. Nice. A lot of people got to do it. Uh, I know Landon Tice played mm -hmm. him. Uh, I think Nathan Gamble played him a few other, uh, somewhat notable people. I mean, I'm sure other notable people I just didn't hear about also played him. And then like just a couple of like random people on social media got the chance to play with Doug Polk. And I just yeah. think that's super cool. Um, so as far as far as uh, the experience of it, I actually, I felt like I held my own pretty well, which is okay. funny because I am not a heads up player. Uh, I did do a fair bit of prep, prep going in. Um, if anybody's curious about kind of like the details on it, you can always check out my uh, ask me anything thread. You can ask me more detailed questions there. I don't want to go too on about my prep for it, but the biggest thing I was doing was just like studying, studying opening ranges and, and working on my C betting strategy. Cause that's the, the spots you're in the most basically. And you don't want to mess up too badly. Right. Um, but yeah, one of my highlights from playing against him, I, I enjoyed playing and streaming, but it was very hard to do both play two tables of heads up is, is um, very mentally taxing and then streaming and interacting with chat is also taxing. And then of course I'm playing Doug Pokes and I hyped it up. So it's like my biggest stream ever. Like I yeah. was streaming to, th to 300 people, um, which for me is a lot. Like I'm used to anywhere from 20 to like 70 mm -hmm. and 300 is a very different chat than like 25 oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. By, by a big stretch. So, um, but I think I played well. Uh, I We were basically neck and neck for a really long time. And then he won a couple of four bet pots. Like I, I lost every time I was all in. And you know, like heads up, you're, you're going to lose. And like, I lost two buy-ins. Standard. And honestly, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I thought that it was a great experience just for the playing. Even like the experience of playing a good player heads up made me more confident in my heads up game and, you know, going into other, other things. My, my all time favorite moment though, was after the match. Uh, so we, we were DMing on Twitter about setting okay. it up and everything. And, um, he basically said like, I thought you played really well. And I was like, I mean, I, can I, paid, die happy. I, paid, okay. <laughs> I paid like, you know, $700 for Doug Polk to tell me I played well. No, um, <laughs> but it was, it was just really cool because, you know, again, like he didn't have to say that, like he right. didn't have to go out of his way. And so it was just, it was just really nice. And I think, it, I think it's also a good lesson in how small acts from uh, basically, basically small acts of kindness can, mm. you know, be passed down to people who it will impact greater than the effort that you're putting in. For sure. Um, and that's actually, I mean, I feel like that's really, that's almost cards chat in a nutshell, because 
like people who sort of um, co come into the community who are maybe a little more skilled or more experienced and effectively give their time, uh, usually for free, um, and, and are willing to pass along knowledge or pass along experiences and stories and, and all that stuff is just, it's kind of one of the things that makes um, I think poker communities in general are very cool, but that I see happen consistently on Card Chat. So, you know, I know obviously everybody listening to this probably knows that already, but, you know, a little plug for, for Cards Chat anyway. Oh, we got we got a couple uh, questions about Card Chat, and I want to ask them, yeah. but I do want to give you a chance to plug something else first, because <laughs> I know that at the end of this month, September, you'll be hosting a meetup game uh, in yes. Las Vegas at the Sahara. Uh, just go ahead, let us know what we need to know and, and why the Sahara, actually. Why did you choose there? Sure thing. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. If you gave me a plug opportunity, that was definitely going to be it. So I, I was ready, but you you preempted me. So again, well done. Excellent uh, podcasting skills here. Interviewing Thanks, skills. Um, yeah, so uh, basically the gist of it, it's September 28th, I think 6 p.m. at the Sahara Poker Room. It's The idea of it is a pretty like inclusive and fun game. So the blinds are two, three, which is, you know, a standard kind of low stakes game, but the buy-in is 200 to a thousand. Oh, uh, the idea, the idea okay. being that you don't have to have a ton to come in and play like 200, super reasonable for most people who play live poker. Um, but if you're interested in playing deeper, you know, if you take it more seriously, if you want to bring in your friend, you both buy in max and really screw around with each other. Uh, there's the opportunity to do that. There's the opportunity to play a little shorter or play a little deeper. Um, every straddle is live. <laughs> so oh if you want to play a little bigger and your table sort of, uh, amenable to it that you can easily <laughs> put on several straddles if you wish. Um, but obviously not mandatory and it's the, the whole real point, I think, and, and this, you can't credit this to me because I didn't, you know, form the first meetup game, but the idea behind a meetup game is just let's go be social and play this game that we all love. And, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't have to be about maximizing. It doesn't have to be about like really making the most money and, and being super serious. Like it's right. going to be fun. It's just going to be a fun time. Let's have a good time um, right? I'll be, I'll be making a video out of it. And, and a lot of people there like to come on and it's one of the contexts where they get to maybe make their face, make the vlog instead of just a hand that they played. Right. Uh, so we, so we have kind of like, uh, you know, like we're allowed to film during it. And I, I think that anybody coming in could also film. So I'm hoping a couple other, maybe like smaller vloggers want to come in and hang out. That's usually a, a good time. And, and I, I have done the same, you know, I, as a, as a budding vlogger, or even as an established vlogger going into these meetup games and um, with bigger channels, but having the opportunity to film where, you know, maybe I'm not always able to film or get as good footage. So right. um, that should be a ton of fun. And uh, there's a Facebook uh, event that it's ideal if you RSVP to that, because then I could put you on the list. Um, as far as why Sahara, it's funny. I have a friend who, uh, goes by Persuadio on social media. I think he's Chris. out of position on Twitter, but yeah, yeah Chris Murray, Good guy. who uh, has an existing relationship with them. And he hosts a couple of games a week there. It started out as just one game a week. And I kind of, I kind of took some of the elements of what this game looks like from that game. That game is actually a a Thursday night. It's two, three, no limit. So again, small blinds, but it is very deep stacked. So it's actually, a, that one is a 600 min, no cap. Ooh, okay. Yeah. So very be more different. adventurous. I, I played, <laughs> yeah. So I played in a couple times. I thought the vibe was very good. Um, they have this back table in a super nice area. It's also just a little bit more intimate. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Beautiful, like a seven really. or it's a seven or eight table room. It's very new and very nice. And you're just not in the thick of it as much as, you know, I, I won't throw any casinos under the bus, but like there's a couple properties that I'm sure we could all name where like, it's just not the best experience as a poker player. Like mm -hmm. it's just really loud or you're right next to people smoking or, you know, like there's all kinds of stuff. And I've just, right. I just found the experience of sitting in the Sahara to be really nice. Uh, the last and just super practical reason is that these smaller properties particularly the ones that aren't like right in the middle of the strip. Right. Uh, Sahara is a little further North. They just benefit from having a little more foot traffic. And so when I, when I find a spot that I like, I like spending time there. I don't, I really don't mind just like bringing, bringing some traffic there. And, awesome. and I think that so far I've had a great experience with all the staff and, and especially management who has been super accommodating. They're basically like, 
Matt, we're, we got the dealers. You just got to tell us what the game's going to be. And, Beautiful. Um, so they, they've been great to work with, and I'm super excited to, to get it going. I guess that's a shout out to Stephen uh, Pick, PK. That's yeah, how it's yeah I, I think Pick, but yeah. Pick. yeah, yeah good Steve. guy. Yeah, very yeah, nice. Very cool. I'm sure everyone uh, who is listening to this, and if you want to go and check that out, you can have a great time. I've also played in the room. Beautiful room, brand new. Uh, you know, you feel like, wow, <laughs> it's like a first class of an airline cabin. It's, it's like really, yeah. really like just splendor all around you. It's really cool <laughs> stuff. Um, all right. I said we talk Cards Chat. We'll talk about your role um, with Cards Chat as an ambassador now. What does this role sort of mean to you? And do you have any sort of things that you specifically want to achieve uh, as a Cards Chat ambassador? Um, yeah, so we've kind of mentioned it a couple of times, but I am a very long time member of Cards Chat. I, yep. I think my account is probably like 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And I, I think my first post is probably closer to 10 years old at this point. But I, I have like some thread in there that's just like, you know, my first thread ever, that's like some bad beat story, right? Just, <laughs> and I, it's a bad beat story, but like I played it bad and there's like really good advice in there. And I was a very new player who was just coming to the realization that this game could be played at a very high level and that I was not there and mm. that I could use some help. And I didn't necessarily have a direct poker friends who were taking it seriously like I was. I didn't have a community to lean into. I was kind of in training sites at this point, but I, I wasn't like I, the training sites really didn't have communities built around them as much at that point, just wasn't as easy to do uh, as it is with like, you know, certain tools nowadays, sure. software wise. And so Cards Chat was really like my first poker home. And mm. so I think that, you know, obviously I have uh, kind of, I've trailed off a bit in my involvement over the years as I have kind of like, become more invested in just my own stuff and my own brand. It's hard to be involved everywhere. Yeah. And that's just happened very naturally, but I've always felt a very strong connection to the card chat community. And uh, I, I still actually have a progress thread. I think I, I think I've made two or three, but they've, they, they've existed across like years of time Amazing. in any posts. And, um, and so card chat, you know, it's always kind of like a home away from home. You know, I try to come back and play like the um, the sort of like team events that, that happened for WSOP. And sure. I always like meet up with a couple of those guys like every year. And, you know, it, it's just, it feels so good to be able to come on with cards chat and sort of, it really feels like coming home, man. I'm like, I'm getting a little bit emotional, but oh. um, yeah, it's, it, it, it feels, it feels really great. And as far as like kind of just the specifics of my role, um, it, a lot of what I'm going to be doing with cards chat is just being accessible to the community. And so, uh, the, the, the biggest thing I do is I'll have this ask me anything thread. It's actually already kicked off. And, uh, I, I was, it was kind of funny because I had a week where I was playing a lot and like, the thread was a little slow leading up to that. So I was like, not checking it as much. And then okay. I, like I, the first day I checked again, I was like, Whoa, there's like a lot of questions, <laughs> um, but like really good questions. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be a thread where like you can really ask me anything poker, um, you, even like finances in the context of like playing poker and, and sure. whatever. Uh, so anything kind of like loosely related, I'm happy to kind of shoot the breeze about. But on top of that, you know, as a poker vlogger, um, as somebody who has worked a lot in in the video format, I felt that my skill set can serve the card check community through video as well. And so nice. the other big thing I'm going to be doing is I'll be making videos for the community. Uh, a lot of that will st like topically speaking, that will stem from the ask me anything thread. So if you guys, you know, have a really burning question and you think it might be worth uh, kind of a deeper discussion, I, I may well choose to talk about it and elaborate a little more through video. Um, probably the number one thing that I think again, this sort of comes back to what's my big draw as a content creator, what's my strength. Uh, hand breakdowns are, are really kind of where I think I excel. And so um, that's going to be somewhere I think people will kind of gravitate toward in that thread and, and a place I expect to see myself making more videos. Since it comes very naturally to me, I do it for the vlog quite a bit. And um, it's also, you know, kind of like the number one thing that I think made me a lot better during the time I was with Cards Chat as like a, a sort of beginning player was I, I post a lot of my own hands. I took people's replies very seriously and had back and forth discussions. 
And I replied to other people's hands too. And it, it's actually funny. This is like one of the things I still try to impart to students is like, this is the number one thing to get better at poker is just going through hands as much as possible, whether they're your hands, other people's hands, doesn't even matter. Um, and sometimes going through other people's hands is even better uh, yes. because you don't have all this like emotional baggage around, oh, how did right. I play this? Did I play it good or not? Right. Um, so I'll be, I'll be here and there uh, in the forums as well. Uh, you know, I'll pop into some threads once in a while. And of course I'll be repping cards chat anytime I'm, you know, on a live stream or, uh, you know, like uh, at WSOP, I hopefully will make my first uh, WSOP final table this year. I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. Good luck. I'm feeling pretty nice. good about my chances, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's kind of funny to come so full circle in a way that just feels so right. I, mm. I couldn't really have envisioned uh, a better situation. Pretty Amazing. Much. Amazing. Super happy for you. And, you know, we talked about this AMA thread. It dovetails perfectly. Uh, you know, we got to move on to the segment of the show where we ask everyone watching, everyone listening, you guys in the Cards Chat community, uh, what do you want to ask our guests? We do also have a dedicated thread in the Cards Chat forums for this. So as we announce who the future guests will be, please be sure to send in your questions. Now, I don't know if these are burning questions about hands, <laughs> Matt, and we got a good dozen or so. I'll try to get through as many as we can here in the time we got remaining, but uh, some wonderful forum members have submitted some stuff for you. Uh, we'll start off with Crystal's uh, a big one. Uh, Matt, what goals have you set for yourself in 2021? Wow, that is a big question. Yeah, right. Um, it's that's tough, and I it's a good question though. And it's funny because when people ask me about goals, I'm always like, oh, darn it, I gotta come up with some good goals. <laughs> it's now. okay to just go um, off the fly. <laughs> no, no, but it's you know, um, I, I think that in general, I I sort of split my this is gonna, this is gonna get a this might be big. I might rant long on this, but uh, I split kind of my life into a sort of like very broad categories of like, okay, what am I trying to accomplish maybe like on a day uh, in sort of like a week or month sort of time frame, And then like beyond that, it's like, all right, then what are the more short-term goals? And then it's like, what's the long-term path? Mm. And I think that sometimes it's helpful to work short-term to long-term. Sometimes it's helpful to work long-term to short-term. But when I think about like long, like long-term big picture, basically starting big picture, like what, what am I doing? with my life right like mm. that's that's the number that's, one thing because like sure. how do you have a goal without knowing like where you're trying to get to you of know course. and so as a, a human being in a capitalist society i i obviously need to make money right. that is a component of living yeah and so one of my obviously larger picture goals is to just increase my financial security uh increase my bankroll plan for retirement i don't necessarily want to be working till i'm 60 plus. So Legit. as just a very big picture thing, I, I, I want to be working towards retirement very seriously. And uh, obviously we're not going to talk about the numbers involved in that, but no, but it's, uh, you, know, you don't often hear that for someone, you know, late twenties, early thirties already thinking yeah. that way. Like, I think that's a good message to send to folks out there in a similar situation. Yeah. You know, you gotta yeah, think ahead. So, um, so that's like very logical, practical, <laughs> pragmatic, sure. whatever. Um, the, the other sort of things I want to work toward are, I think, continuing to walk down the path that I'm walking, which is um, increasing my reach in the poker community, um, increasing my impact, and ideally the, the positivity that comes from that. And, you know, sort of just furthering my brand, whether that's in poker or outside of it, I, I don't see myself like leaving poker anytime soon. But I'm also aware that what I'm building has the potential to allow me to jump into other pursuits if, if I wanted to and, and do so in a similar way. So, you know, what, what does that look like on a sort of shorter term basis? Well, a lot of people might say, oh, well, do you want to get to X number of subscribers? And, you know, like the answer is obviously, yes, I, I would love to <laughs> get to, I mean, I'm, I'm very close to 20,000 now, but get to like, you know, 20, then 50, then hundred, I would love to. But the reality is like goals like that are often, I think a little bit detrimental to say, oh, I want to, I want to get to 50,000 subs in 2021. Uh, well, maybe 2022. Let's right. uh, set our sights at least a little bit reasonable here. <laughs> okay. um, but I think that these goals can sometimes hurt you a bit if right. you don't have a more 
kind of like practical or measurable element to, or not measurable, because obviously it's measurable to say I have 50,000 subs or I don't, but have actionable parts of your goal. Sure. Uh, so, you, so people talk a lot about like smart goals. I don't necessarily always try to break it down into like those elements uh, specifically, but I do try to say, okay, well, I want 50,000 subs uh, or X amount of views in the next year, let's say, right. but how do I get there? And the reality mm -hmm. is like, I don't get there by wanting 50,000 subs. I get there by doing a number of things. I get there by- Do the work, uh, right? Yeah, I, I, I wanna play consistent volume. Uh, which, which for me can fluctuate, but for right now, my, my short term is like, I want no fewer than two live poker cash game sessions a week, because that's how I make content. Um, I want to publish one to two videos of those sessions per week. And one of the things that I've done very recently to help make that a reality is I I've hired editors. Okay. And this is something that I have. Uh, put off and off for a very long time and it's very hard to let go of like yes. my baby um, I know that feeling for and, sure. and sort of not just the struggles of delegation that come with it like logistically handing things off to people but just the the raw emotionality of like I have to let go of this and let somebody else be in charge of right some piece of it so um it was it was kind of funny actually because I uh gave some trial work to some editors, like the creative side of the editing. And the, I, I got back like the first sort of like sample, sample mm -hmm. work, sample edit. And I was like, I can't believe I didn't do this like two years ago. Like it was just, oh, it wow. was just so, it was so clear to me after, after I took that like leap of faith of here, do like, I'm going to pay you do some yeah. work for me, seeing how it turned out and being like, wow, this is basically what I would have done or, you know, in some contexts better. Um, and it didn't cost that much money. There you go. Uh, and, and so, you know, and obviously, learn, though, no, you know, so. yeah, no, I, I can't regret what I did because that's what got me to where I am. Sure, and, of course. Um, I, it's a full learning experience and, you know, it's funny. I, not to get super existential or, or you know, super theor uh, philosophical here, but, you know, I'm a big believer in kind of like, you know, free will, sure. But like at the end of the day, I, I couldn't have done it before I did it in a lot of yeah. ways. Like I wasn't, I wasn't at the point where I was ready for it until I was ready for Speaking it. Speaking so, my language. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I, I have to, I have to also give myself some credit there for, uh, for, growing to that yeah. to that point <laughs> yeah legit good good answer i like that a lot and i wish you obviously very good luck uh, as you uh continue to to blaze the path towards those goals um <laughs> yanko 57 here's a new name i haven't seen before thank you yanko for submitting these questions matt who is your toughest opponent to date Ooh. um that's a really interesting question i i think like i play online a lot and so it's it's sometimes i know who i'm playing sometimes i don't <laughs> kind of thing i mean there are there, you know there are a few kind of like online <clears throat> screen names who i i think you know are, are very tough but who people wouldn't really connect with it because they don't know who they are in, mm -hmm. in person um there's a couple online regs who i think who are also live players who i think are incredibly good and incredibly tough to play against tim riley is one that comes to mind who i've both played with um like online a fair bit and then also i just have played with him like once or twice live mm -hmm. and i actually once was on like day four of the marathon i had him on my table with like two or three tables left i was like well this this is <laughs> not good <laughs> yeah, but there's a reason he's there he's clearly knows right. what he's doing right um and then as far as like people i've played a fair bit with live most of them are just like cash game players so it's kind of hard to uh, enumerate them, but I'm going to give a funny answer. So, uh, not necessarily the toughest opponent skill wise, but the toughest to be around was probably Maurice Hawkins <laughs> because, uh, I, if you don't know who he is, it's not going to be as funny to you, but you know, just, just go search a couple of like trash talking things from him. Cause he's like, I mean, I think he's very good for the game in a lot of ways, but he's, uh, he could be a little abrasive from time to time. And, uh, I, I actually, it was probably only my first or second time ever playing with him. He was playing a lot on East Coast back in the day. I think I was playing a circuit event with him. Or maybe it was WSB. I don't remember. But the it was like a hand where, you know, I don't know. He opens MP. I'm like the big blind. I defend with some uh, ace high hand. And like he C-bets flop. I call with ace high. 
turn checks through and it's like an all low board and uh river comes whatever it comes it doesn't really matter but the point is i check river he bets and i can't call with ace high and it's good I, I beat king high okay and you have to imagine like you know it's wsop like sure. a serious moment it might be day two um not sure if we're inside the money or not but this was in the marathon as well actually uh a few years ago and i'm just some young kid right like mm-hmm. I, it's clear, it's clear. I take the game seriously. So it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really in it. Like, and I got, I call with these high, I, like I won the pot and just deadpan, like goes from like, not looking at me at all. Just like, then looks at me and he goes, just quit poker. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. wow. He goes, just quit poker. You, you'll save yourself. You save yourself a lot of money. I'm like, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, in the moment, obviously, like it's very off-putting, but you know, right. it's, it's, now it's like just one of my all-time favorite stories. That's hilarious, <laughs> hilarious, and a very interesting answer there. Shout out to Maurice Hawkins. Um, <laughs> Shells, thank you very much for submitting some questions here. Um, we'll pick this one, uh, Matt. What did you? Oh, okay. What did you do before jumping into poker full time? What's that? What was that regular nine-to-five job? Yeah, so I, and it's, it's funny because the company I work for was like pretty big and actually has like a reasonably thriving poker community. Madison has a, has a big poker community. So um, right after college, I moved to Madison to work for this company called Epic, which, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't guess what it, what it does because they don't mean Epic like, wow, that was, that was so Epic, man. Right. Uh, it's like an Epic, like a tale. Like the, na- oh, like the narrative okay, or the journey. Okay. So you can talk about like a like a old I don't know a Greek, uh, an old Greek you know sure. story, uh, is an epic about whoever. And so uh, what they do is they make uh, the electronic medical records that oh, you okay. you know like when you're do- when you're visiting your doctor and they're typing into the system like mm-hmm. that's what they're typing into and that's the software that um, it runs a lot of stuff on the back end for you know just like what is going on with you, notes from the doctor, test results, and they have tons of applications. It's a very complex, very big piece of software. So that company was, while I was working for them for like two and a half years, uh, grew from something like six, five or 6,000 to like 9,000 people, like just over that short period of time. So they were getting massive. Uh, I didn't really like the job that much at the time, but I also think that I had a lot of shortcomings as an employee. Um, but you know, again, can't really be, I can't really have regrets about it because it, it did help set up sort of my financial base to let me leap into poker uh, a little more seriously. And it also, uh, showed me some of the things about myself that I needed to work on. And more than that showed me that I probably didn't want to work at a nine to five anyway. And that right. a lot of elements of being my own boss were very attractive, even though I had a lot of like, you know, stuff with work ethic I had to work on to even get to the point where being my own boss worked out too. Like there were definitely growing pains with that, but, um, you know, I, I would say that that experience overall was, was one of the things that was also a catalyst toward like, all right, I'm not going to find another job. I'm going to, I'm going to try to really jump into poker. Right. Oh, interesting, interesting road. Uh, and like you said, you know, you can't have regrets about it because that yeah. brought you to where you are today. So very interesting. Yep. Cool. Um, another name I haven't seen before, Shanist. Shanist, thank you very much for sending in this one. Um, this is also it dives a little bit deeper into the vlogs. Um, Matt, do you find it more difficult to put together vlogs where you made a lot of mistakes and lost money as opposed to the ones where you run good and win? I really like that question. That's a really good question. And um, it's actually funny because a lot of people sort of seem to think think that I like, I mean, either make up hands, just straight up make them up. Um, cause sure. like, cause I, I used, well, I used to not use table footage. Like I, before, oh, like it okay. wasn't really a big thing, um, for me in the beginning. And so like, you're just like, oh, you just made up hands. I'm like, I wouldn't make up this hand. Like it's too outrageous for me to make up. <laughs> it's like, it's like a movie script. I couldn't even, I couldn't even write that script, right. but, um, no, it's it, a lot of people seem to think that, I omit hands I misplay or, you know, I omit, you know, not me specifically, just vloggers in general. Sure. Um, They're like, Matt, you're a liar. (laughs) Um, But it's uh, yeah, it is definitely, it can be harder. It can be harder, especially if I am working on it right after the fact. Now 
it's hard to work on it right after the fact because I'm pretty far behind right now. I, I have been pretty right. far behind for quite a while just because I tend to go through sprints where I play a lot and don't publish a lot. And then I publish a lot and don't play a lot. Ebbs and flows, um, for sure. Yeah. And I'm trying to work on that because YouTube favors consistency and, and volume of posting so heavily with the algorithm. And I actually think that that ebb and flow was good for me in some contexts where I, I felt like I got to really hone in on one thing, focus in on poker mm -hmm. or hone in on content creation, really get better at that work on the stuff I needed to get better on with it. But it hurt me in the long run from a subscriber standpoint, just because mm -hmm. I, I wasn't getting put in front of as many eyes, whatever. Right. But as far as like, how hard is it to talk about? You know, I talk about hands I misplay with coaches a lot of times uh, or, or, you know, like with peers and that's never hard for me, but it's harder when you're viewed as an authority mm. to then say like, Hey, I really screwed this hand up. Right. And here's why. And you know, whatever. And I, I think that I wasn't an authority when I started. And so it was not that hard. It was just, here's hands I played. And some of them I played badly. Some of them I didn't. I didn't view myself in that light at all. And as people started to gravitate toward me for the hand analysis, for strategy, and, and also as becoming more and more of a coach, being seen as an authority definitely makes it harder, I think, to talk about mistakes because, you know, I, I think that, Ultimately, it does help me because people appreciate the honesty, of course, 100%, and, right. and, and it's real, right? It's human. Yeah. And I think that's important to get across, even if it's not benefiting me, I think it, it benefits other people to be like, well, this, this guy who I look up to just, he punted and like, that's okay. That's going to happen sometimes. And you can still be successful and own up to these mistakes and make these mistakes. Um, so, but yeah, it, it definitely can be harder. Uh, sometimes re even just reliving hands that you, you know, made, made really bad plays on, uh, right. not so much losing as, as okay. the bad plays. Okay. And I, I've all, I've always had a hard time with mistakes, relatively speaking. Like I've always hated making mistakes and I've had a, a harder time addressing mental game issues in my own mind that were around playing worse. Uh, rather than like losing hands or like bad mm -hmm. beats or whatever. And a big part of that has been that, you know, again, getting a little bit deep here, a big part of my life for a long time now has been like assigning poker uh, into part of my self-identity. And it's, imp it's important to have poker in my identity because it's part of what drives me and I'm excited about it every day. But I don't want poker to drive my self-worth, right? I don't want especially individual results or individual hands where I messed up to define my self-worth, right? And that's, that can be a thin line. Um, and so, you know, being forced to talk about it is good because I also have to confront that stuff, but it can be very challenging for sure. Uh, well, it was a, like you said, a great question, a really, really good answer as well. Yeah, so you. I, you know, it's, a, it's good to go deep on that one. I appreciate it. Um, we'll have time for one last one. Uh, our good old acid burned FX always asks the most creative questions. We'll ask a, a little bit more of a lighthearted, fun one to end off the show. Okay, uh, Matt, how, how do you waste the biggest chunk of time each week? Oh, no. <laughs> um, you, it actually, it changes uh, from, from time to time, but I would say the, the most time that I waste consistently is going to be Netflix for sure. Um, just an you know, investment. That's not a waste. Yeah. Oh, oh. I don't know about it depends that. What uh, you're watching on Netflix. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so yeah, I mean, I watch a lot of like, not garbage, but you know, shows that are not educational in any way, you know, okay. there's they're just pure entertainment. Um, but I, I would say like, my number one, because that one, like I still derive a lot of enjoyment out of okay, it. Still, right. It still benefits my life. But I would say the most nefarious, I guess, time waster for me is just my, my own procrastination. Hmm. Um, and a lot of times I find that that comes from like sort of, I, maybe I work on a, maybe I work on a project that I'm excited about, but it's not really going to further my goals or further what I'm trying to accomplish right. to not have to work on the stuff that I don't feel like doing that will actually move the needle. And so, you know, it's like, maybe it's not considered a waste of time because it's work, 
but it's, it, I'm not prioritizing it correctly. So I, I would say, you know, every waste of time is, is a misapplication of priorities. Right. But uh, very consistently, I, I used to, I used to do this where I would like find something else to do really, like, Oh, I'll watch poker content because that's, you know, that's still good. Right. right. Like I'm studying <laughs> or, you know, whatever, right. or, you know, I'm researching other YouTube channels. And like, those are things are all true. There are times where I do seek out, like, I'm, I'm going to go watch this vlog because I mm -hmm. need to see how rampage is crushing it. And he's doing stuff I'm not doing. That's very effective. And I want to learn from that. Mm -hmm. That's good when it's targeted, when it's meaningful, when it's purposeful, but that's not usually the case, right? Like sometimes I'll just drift off and, and whatever. And, uh, yeah, probably the number one thing is just like, not like wanting to take a break while working and wanting to work while taking a break, mm. because then I'm do then I'm doing both things poorly. Um, that's, that's, yeah. that's a tough one. I think, again, a lot of us, I think sort of, <laughs> understand that and i think that's an answer that resonates with a lot of us so uh again deeper i thought it was a little bit more lighthearted, but that's again well, it's, a, it's a fantastic I, answer it's a good i gave good i gave thing. you netflix i gave you netflix and then i gave you you know my existential like there work ethic problem there you go <laughs> well uh you know like i said i had prepared a bunch more and we had a bunch more so maybe we'll even have you on again at some point matt it's just been wonderful and i want to just also thank everyone who sent in those great questions for matt vaughn uh, those, if you didn't get a chance to get your questions answered, Matt did mention he's got that AMA on the Cards Jet forums. And of course, uh, we've got, uh, you know, our own dedicated thread as well, where you go ahead and submit your questions for the future podcast guests. Guys, if you like the show, please give us a good review on iTunes. Spread the word via your social media channels. Um, Matt, before we let you go, anything else you'd like to tell our audience? Uh I, I, this is always the hardest part. Um, you know, I, I guess just want to sort of, uh, I guess, impart how happy I am to be back with cards chat on a more sort of official basis. And, um, you know, if, if any of you guys ever need anything, I'm, I'm super accessible through the threads. You can even, you know, if, if it's something personal, you can DM me even I, uh, there were many times in my poker career where I, um, could have used or, or did receive sort of like input from a, a player who's a little more experienced than me had been through things I'd been through or, or was going through and, uh, and really appreciated kind of how giving those people always seem to be with their time. And it's something I want to kind of pay forward as much as possible. So uh, yeah, you know, just, just hit me up anywhere that I'm around and, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to be, to be helpful. Cool. And, you know, again, like you said, hit you up at the Sahara, September 28th, September 28th, 6 PM. Good stuff. All right, well, Absolutely. I won't necessarily be there, but I do hope to see you at the World <laughs> Series of Poker. Uh, Matt Vaughn, Absolutely. thank you very much again uh, for joining us. Uh, guys, thank you all for joining us on another episode of Cards Chat. I'm Robbie Straczynski. You can follow me on Twitter at Card Player Life. I wish you all a wonderful day. <laughs>